hear me? Can everyone hear me? Good evening. Hi. Welcome. My name is Lynn Carrillo, and I'm here on behalf of Enoch Turner Schoolhouse. So good to see you. There are rules in this schoolhouse. The first one is please put your cell phone on silent. And secondly, the vaping monitors are on in the washrooms. <laughs> so to begin, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, including Inuit and Métis. As you know, the schoolhouse is about the history of education, but tonight we're beginning a program about the future of education. It's my pleasure to introduce the creator of the program, Dr. Paul Axelrod. Paul is a historian of education and a professor and formerly the Dean of Education at the Faculty of Education at York University. This is the third series of issues related to current education that Paul has organized for us and we're very grateful. Paul, over to you. Well, welcome to a thought-provoking two-part series delving into the dynamic landscape of AI and its impact on the future of education. In this series, we'll be examining the implications of AI in both K-12 education and post-secondary institutions, shedding light on the pertinent, consequential, and sometimes controversial aspects of this rapidly evolving field. I'm guessing that many high school and university students are incorporating AI into their uh, educational lives more easily than many of their teachers and professors. How should educators and families be addressing the use of AI? What are the creative ways it can be employed in the classroom? What are the dangers? Our first panelist captures the challenges ahead with the title of her presentation, The Good, the bad and the ugly, navigating and advancing the frontier of education through AI. Now, I should admit something important. The preceding introduction was co-written by two entities, me and ChatGPT. Ponder that. Our moderator will introduce tonight's panelists, so let me introduce the moderator, Dr. Claire Brett, uh, Professor Emerita, OISE University of Toronto. Claire is former chair of the Department of Curriculum, Teaching and Learning at OISE UT. And for the last 30 years, she's been involved in a wide variety of research projects in the design of blended and online learning environments in classrooms, offering many of her graduate courses online. The author of numerous articles and conference presentations, Claire co-leads the Pepper Project, which asks the question, what does online interaction really contribute to the online learning experience? She's the co-editor of a recent book called Handbook of Research on Online Discussion-Based Teaching Methods. Claire, thank you, and over to you. Thank you so much, Paul. I have to na navigate my uh, microphone. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, good, because I, I don't want to be right in the microphone. Okay. All right. Well, it's, yes, it's my pleasure to, um, I'm also really interested to hear what our three presenters have to say tonight, as it's, this has be, become a very hot topic on our research group, and we're also doing um, some research on um, issues relating to education and AI. And there's been so much written on this recently, but at, at the same time, the, the pace of change is so huge that you, it seems difficult to keep up with the, the changes in the literature and, um, and to, you know, to really figure out what's going on. So 
I find it, it's so helpful when you hear um, individual pieces of work that people have been doing because it makes some of these giant problems that seem to present themselves with this issue of AI, it puts them in a, in a kind of more relatable context. And so I'm sure that we will find this a very valuable and helpful experience. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first panelist, um, Dr. Yunus Chang. Professor of Applied Psychology and Human Development at OISE, um, who I know well. <laughs> um, she's a distinguished researcher at the forefront of language and literacy assessment, specializing in the innovative application of artificial intelligence to enhance formative and diagnostic assessment methods. And the, her talk is indeed the good, the bad, and the ugly, navigating and advancing the frontier of education through AI. Uh, as the generative AI is transforming, or some people might say disrupting our society, uh, we are here in the oldest actually public school to talk about the generative AI. So I want to engage you all in conversations about the role of um, AI in education for our students and teachers. So let me introduce a teacher, Virginia. Saturday night, all her friends are going to the annual musical. And here she was, marking essays, 34 of them. It would be a little palatable to her if she thought her marking of student essays would have any lasting influence on students. And, but she didn't believe that at all. Let's meet Minsu. Minzu came to Canada six months ago. He has yet to learn English, right? As you can see, the teacher speaks English and the child speaks back a different language. So can AI help both Virginia and Minzu? Technological innovations through AI, especially generative AI, can indeed support both Virginia and Minzu. With AI, no more one size fits all. We can lower language and learning barriers for our students. Teacher can be freed from time consuming administrative and pedagogical documentation. AI and its machine learning can adapt, adapt educational content to each student's learning needs. We can consider their learning pace. Some people can learn quickly and some people can actually take some time and they have a different sort of style, right? We can analyze the students' responses to instruction real time. We can further tailor the difficulty level of learning materials based on our understanding, understanding of their needs. This personalization, which is the key, uh, a benefit of generative AI can really help improve um, students' learning by uh, providing accessible content for everybody. Students very often are overwhelmed with the vast amount of learning materials that they have to go through. Now, generative AI can help them, right? They can save time so they can focus on higher order thinking skills and problem solving skills. Dynamic simulations can be used to really create or help students to visualize very complex scientific problems or historical matters. AI can break learning barriers, increase accessibility, especially for those students who have very unique learning needs. For example, Microsoft Immersive Reader um, leverages AI uh, to enhance the students' reading comprehension with uh, uh, students with the dyslexia, for example. So it provides features like text decoding solutions, you know, read aloud options, even text spacing adjustments, all done automatically, making learning content more accessible to students who have uh, learning disabilities. Google speech recognition, I think they unveiled very recently um, children can learn uh, their uh, different languages um, using such tools. Automated data processing using AI 
enhances teacher's pedagogical documentation. You can see, right, all the post-its. And teachers spend a lot, just like Virginia, you know, how much time they have to spend outside their regular uh, school hours. And they have to do a constant assessment, all done manually, and they have to spend endless nights and times uh, scoring and marking student work. Now, all of that can be automated uh, in terms of data collection and analysis, streamlining access for our educators, meaning now our educators and teachers can really focus on what matters to our students, okay? And think about when assessment is done and how long it takes for teachers to provide feedback for our students, many weeks. By then, students forgot about what they did, right? That time lapse, a critical loss in education. Now we can overcome such problems through the automation. Let me illustrate some of these ideas by showcasing Balance AI, digital language and, and literacy assessment tool uh, my team developed. First example is oral reading fluency. Oral reading fluency is one of the strongest predictors of later reading ability, but assessing it using running record and um, different methods it, uh, for teachers to, with 25 students poses a very significant challenge. Using automated speech recognition and also natural language processing, students' oral read aloud can be automatically processed and scored real time within a minute. Um, so here are two examples of our uh, students doing uh, oral read aloud. The first one. I'm finally done with my English. I'm finally done with my English homework, Anton told his mom. His mom gave him a look and asked, oh, really? It took me an hour and a half. Now I better not wait to start my math. Anton quickly took out his work. This should not take too long. In fact, it should only take about 10 minutes. Well, for teachers to do this, how many hours they have to spend? Because they have to listen manually and coding the correct miss, you know, uh, uh, incorrectly spelled you know, words. Right here is that, that one actually, the child actually only, you know, uh, got one word wrong. Here's a second example. I am finally done with my English. I am finally done with my English homework. Anton told his mom. His mom gave him a look and asked, oh, really? It took me an hour and a half. Now, I better not wait to start my math. Anton quickly took on out his work. This should not take too long. In fact, it should only take about 10 minutes. So with this AI application, students perform in front of teacher, or in, right? And the teacher actually sees the result real time. Now they can see where the students struggle. They can intervene right away. Now, if you think about what kind of um, uh, subject matter really is heavily taught and assessed in school system. So in language and literacy area is oftentimes reading and writing. How often do we assess a student's oral language ability? Oral language ability is extremely important skill, but just because of the logistical difficulties, we don't assess a student's language ability. So now we can do, so teacher Virginia can actually um, assess student's uh, speaking ability. So here's an example of the child listening a story first. It was the morning of Monday, September 8th, and the first day of school. Now student, retell that story oops sorry there were a, there was a girl named suzanne um, she was late for school now done automatically again real time teacher can see students uh speaking ability uh, more very fine grain level in terms of, you know, whether or not they can put a narrative together, They're, they can put a, a coherent story together, whether they can use grammar, whether they can use wide range of vocabulary, all done automatically. Now, you met Minsu, who doesn't speak English yet. Now, oftentimes these ESL students are removed from regular classrooms. Oftentimes we have all these crazy stories about 
15-year-old recent immigrant sitting in, at the end of the classroom doing coloring because they can't follow instruction at all. Now, language is no longer a barrier, okay? So this particular task, actually, the child is, um, cannot do any uh, English. The, 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 the child cannot uh, complete the task in English, so the child is speaking Korean. Oh my God, I go, I go. Now, teacher cannot real time understand what the child is saying in another language, in this case, Korean. The focus here is more about whether or not the child challenges cognitive in a delay or the fact that the child is simply learning a language, right? Now, Virginia has 34 essays that she has to go through. Now, student writing ability also can be assessed real time in a classroom setting using um, AI and machine learning application. Here are two samples of student writing, and these are the machine scores. Machine actually very clearly can distinguish writing ability between these two graders. And those are the scores that are provided across different writing skills. Now, those are all goods. There are good benefits that we can really leverage technologies for our students and teachers, but also there are a lot of bads. Okay, there are a lot of concerns about um, AI in education. So, what? First, digital divide, right? So, if you think about rural and lower income class, you know, uh, lower income areas, students do not have or may not have actually um, access to high speed internet. Um, they, don't, they may not have modern devices and hindering their ability to benefit from AI. Now, if some school boards also located in such rural areas where, you know, accessibility is limited. So teachers really, this divide, right, which is really reflecting the social um, um, inequalities, uh, makes it challenging for teachers to implement blended learning strategies that utilize these AI tools. Also, over-relying on AI may neglect opportunities for students to engage in hands-on learning um, experiences and critical thinking exercises and social interactions that matter, right? So students really need to have human interactions. So if AI continue to provide answers and summaries for students, right? Um, they may not really uh, uh, engage themselves in learning original material. So do you remember when the OpenAI uh, unveiled ChatGPT and how school boards reacted, banning. Students are cheating. The language was cheating. When the rest of the society and the world are using technologies, everybody's talking about leveraging technologies, students' use of technologies was cheating. Why? The release of new artificial intelligence software is raising questions in schools about its use and what's considered cheating. John Flatters has more on what schools are doing about their guidelines in a changing educational landscape. Universities around the country are faced with a new look at an old problem. A new language generation model, ChatGPT, has the ability to respond to questions and write content. Okay, on and on. Meantime, some banned ChatGPT and some embraced ChatGPT. Artificial intelligence is being increasingly used these days, and that includes in schools. In fact, 44% of American teenagers say that they're likely to use AI tools when completing assignments. That's according to a recent Education Week survey. And that's just one of the reasons why the largest school district in New Jersey is bringing the technology into the classroom. You're going to take... Right. So, now, I think it was uh, within a week what happened in Ontario? 
Most people have no clue that in 2023, the best way to make money on Amazon is not with physical. There has just been a major announcement that will affect schools and students across the province. Education Minister Stephen Lecce is tightening policies around cell phone use in Ontario schools. Have a listen. We will be denying cell phone use during instructional time. For our Technologies are being banned in our Ontario classrooms now. Students cannot use technologies. Uh, cell phone can be, students use cell phone for Facebook, but also they can use cell phone for ChatGPT to really understand language and, you know, uh, uh, problems. So what, what it means is, is these are all confusing. You know, what message are we conveying for our educators and students uh, when it comes to AI in education? Confusions abound and we need clear guidance and also AI literacy. Ugly. What many, how many different ugly aspects um, uh, can you think of when you think about AI in education? Data privacy, I'm not going to go into, uh, right? There are increasing concerns about how personal data are collected and student information is sometimes revealed. Like 2019 Pearson clinical assessment data were breached. All our students' private data were uh, leaked. <laughs> Yeah, when those things happen, students now have that psychological impact. They cannot trust school system because they are not protected. What about the machine bias, right? Our machine reflects human bias. They are reproducing existing human biases. And, you know, when you think about natural language processing, because ChatGPT is a language, uh, uh, natural language processing based and uh, automated speech recognition, gender and accents are two most significant factors that influence uh, speaker uh, variability. Non-native English essays are detected as ge AI generated or language learning software trained after native speakers will treat accented speech as wrong. So we need to stop pretending the AI doesn't exist in student lives. We need to stop confusing students by calling their technology use cheating, okay? We need to think about all three, the goods, the bads, the uglies, and I wanna just stop there to continue our conversations tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Mary Ott and she's an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at York University uh, with a focus on literacy education. And Dr. Ott's research explores how elementary teachers adapt their literacy pedagogies in response to new curricula and technologies and was awarded the um, Bombardier Canada Doctoral Scholarship. And her talk is called, It's a Problem and an Opportunity, How Teachers Are Thinking About Generative AI in the Writing Process. Welcome everyone. So here we are in the Enoch Turner Schoolhouse where the three R's were taught. We're still talking about it. <laughs> Reading, writing, and I believe we're going to get into a little bit of arithmetic. <laughs> All right. So uh, how do I enter the conversation? Um, I might be like the, the negative slice of feedback in the positive feedback sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I am going to raise um, some possibilities and concerns. It's a problem and an opportunity, and that's a direct quote from a teacher. So I entered this conversation as an elementary teacher myself for many years before I became a teacher educator. Um, my research and teaching, um, at least a chunk of it, is centered on literacy education and curriculum. Um, and so I am right now responsible for teaching Ontario's new language curriculum, which dropped September 2023 to primary, junior, and junior intermediate teacher candidates. And I also teach graduate students multimodal literacies. So I am doing the research that I'm doing right now to inform my own teaching. Um, how do I advance the slides? Thank you. OK, so I am doing a qualitative study um, with the help of my brilliant research assistant, Mercedes, who's here in the room. Um, we're exploring questions such as what are the implications of generative AI, such as ChatGPT, but there are other forms, for developing writers. Remember, I'm working with elementary and junior intermediate teachers. Um, how are teachers adapting their writing pedagogies to work with, around, or against the use of Gen AI in writing? 
Um, and I'm going to say right now that my position is that all of those responses are appropriate in context for different reasons. And I really want to support teacher agency and taking agency over how they use it, when they use it, why they use it. Um, I'm on track to interview 40 educators in different contexts because we wanted to get a scope. Um, and what I won't be talking about today is the impacts on multilingual writers, um, but we're doing work in that space. Um, I have a collaborator who is interviewing students at the post-secondary level, so we're going to do work in that space and bring our data together. What I'm going to share with you tonight is a smaller bit of the case, a smaller slice of data from nine high school teachers who are local to the Toronto school boards. And I want to center their voices. And here are some emerging findings. So, in this presentation, I want to share uh, preliminary findings. I really want us to empathize with teacher and student needs. Um, curriculum is a design. Like any good design, it begins with understanding what the needs are. Um, that's more than just a trite understanding. That's a deep understanding of all the layers of complexity, and it involves feeling as well, true empathy. Um, we're getting back to talking about valuing thinking and voice in writing. A machine can do the mechanics. Where's the thinking and the voice? I'm starting to think about developing our students' LLMs. Now, an LLM is the short form for a large language model, which is what ChatGPT and other artificial intelligence like that are. They're basically models of our brains that try to simulate the way that we learn and the way that we generate content. So ChatGPT has been fed everything basically in writing and print and on the internet up until 2023, I think. Um, that's as, <laughs> you know, and so that's a poor simulation of how our brains actually work and they're not thinking and feeling, they're generating statistical probabilities, they're computing an answer based on what the most likely, it's kind of a neat party trick. Um, there's all kinds of talk about how it will get better and more, um, it will become more of a realistic model of how our brains work. But, but my problem as a literacy educator of young children is how do I develop our students' brains? <laughs> um, and what I want to say that's encouraging um, is that the answers are in the room. Okay, so because of time, I'm not going to have you actually turn and talk to each other, but that's the most precious thing that we can do as educators, as people, is turn and talk to each other and empathize. So how do you relate to this writer's problem? And what does this writer need in response? And if you're on Zoom, you can feel free to like, you can throw it into the chat. Um, there is, it's a multi-layered problem and it's going to be slightly different for different writers. And let's, um, I think it's a fairly safe assumption that Charlie Brown is um, writing in his first and only language and it's the dominant language. As, as Eunice pointed out in her last perceptions, we already have that language bias built in of English in these machines. Here are the themes from the data about how the high school teachers are feeling, which parallels what um, educators in post-secondary contexts are feeling. Overwhelmed by the surge in unsanctioned use. Frustrated by lack of policy, unacceptable use. Skeptical, skeptical about preventative measures. Interested in learning pedagogical strategies. Concerned about ethical issues. All of the ones that have been raised, plus more that are in the literature, Plus, and I think this is really important to highlight their well being. Um, when people say that they feel overwhelmed and frustrated, that's always a signal that there is some ill being, physically or mentally. It's usually a sign of chronic work overload. Um, they're also concerned about deep versus surface learning. And I see the high school teachers as a bit of canary in the coal mine here, because when I talk to um, high school teachers, but also post-secondary educators, um, there is a concern that we need to take seriously. So let's hear from the high school teachers themselves and their voices. Um, I've never had a crash course or been through a workshop, so I feel like a teacher would be blindsided if they have a student that used it and they wouldn't know what to do. Now, this teacher is not alone because one of my grad students who teaches grade eight said last year, a student handed in something that was clearly auto-generated and she went to her principal to ask what to do. And the principal said, I don't know what to do, 
but the new language curriculum is coming out and it will tell us what to do. <laughs> and I said, well, um, it doesn't really, but I hope you know by the end of this presentation that it does have some things that it can tell us what to do. So frustrated, I don't believe there's a real plan. And it's not like we can really control it anyway. I can't even discipline kids right now. Just putting phones away is a major frustration. I know that some school, some mythical school out there, there's a unicorn of a school that has a policy about how AI is used. What does the literature say? All of those concerns, they're kind of typical in the literature on, on technology, integration, and education. These are typical responses that people go through with any kind of change. That doesn't mean we don't take it seriously, um, especially when it comes to their mental health. But what does the literature say to do about AI? There's basically four categories, big buckets of suggestions. Teach students the art and science of asking good questions. Teach them how to evaluate the output. The output isn't that great when you really dive right into it right now. There's a lot of issues with it. Think about the strengths and limitations of AI as a coach and think about the strengths and limitations of AI as a collaborator. So that's what we've got to work with. So teachers are down with the collaborator and coach piece because of the, their own experiences of using this technology. I use it for ideas and inspirations as this teacher. Um, I know I can Google something, but sometimes chat GPT explains it better. I can ask them to take something that seems like gibberish to me, make it into something concise that I can understand. Notice how they personalize the machine. It's become a they once they're in dialogue. That's interesting. How much suggestion can the computer give you before it's now cheating? We never talk about that with things like peer review or peer editing, says another teacher. Okay. But they also have a concern about AI being used as a calculator. And then they worry about students not learning. And I know there's that like lazy students, cheating students, but listen to the deeper concern. You're just inputting data. You're asking someone else to think for you. And they're concerned about that. How is it changing their writing and the development of their skills? I think it's negatively sometimes. One thing that's positive about it is that, yeah, you can get lots of ideas, good examples. That's actually part of good teaching. But if they rely on it to do the work, I don't know where the critical aspect of the work is. How are they actually going to go find information and sources? Can they go to sources and compare and critique the information and express an idea? I was already noticing, says another high school teacher, the creative, creativity, quality of thought, quality of writing, all seems to have diminished in the last 15 years or so fairly solidly with the rise of smartphones. And so now this is on top of all of that. And it really seems to me like nobody's taking the time to think about things. Now, is this just one teacher venting? No. What happens when students don't read? This is a brain and, um, scan study in 2015 with 8 to 12 year olds. So folks, these are the kids that are now in our high schools and in our first year university. Brain connectivity in children is increased by the time spent reading and decreased by the length of exposure to screen-based media. So we have a problem and an opportunity, says this teacher, and it depends how you define the problem is how you're gonna to frame the solution, right? And this teacher said, everybody's thinking about this, all in all our schools, all the university. I think, I hope some point we're gonna figure something out. But at this point, I think we have a big, I would call it a problem, but it's also an opportunity. The problem is for this teacher, they're staying at the surface. So what do we value about writing? If we take away the mechanics, which we've been saying for years, a machine can do, and there's lots of other kinds of AI and, and software that can take care of the mechanics. What do we actually value about writing? Well, I love what this teacher said. I agree with them. The purpose of writing is to think and speak and have feeling. That quality of thought happens only after considering different points of view and thinking about things for a long time and discussing things with one another. It's work. It takes time. It takes discussion. It takes reading. How should that inform our pedagogies? I'm not going to read these to you, but if you look at the big, bold headings, I hope if you're an educator in the room, you're going, that's not new. <laughs> no, it's not. That's the science of learning. Uh, we already know this stuff. And the good news is this is actually all in um, the new language curriculum. 
But we have to also think about what builds into writing. So how should reading inform how we teach writing? As this teacher writes, I feel like you can't learn to write without reading. Well, think about it. ChatGPT didn't learn how to write without reading. Um, so if they want to become excellent writers, then they need to put that work in to read. And we know this. Reading and writing go better together. They develop better together. We know that. What feeds into reading? What's the foundation of reading and writing? It's listening, it's oral language and visualizing. So that needs to be part of our writing pedagogies. Now we know this in elementary education. I love that this high school teacher who happens to be a language teacher, so they get that, is doing this work. This has transformed my teaching. Grads, you know, in, in undergraduate, graduate, like people are not reading as much anymore. We're just not. I do more in my teaching with even graduate students of visualizing and reading aloud to them and doing shared reading because when you're encountering new vocabulary, new context, you're always learning how to read. I didn't struggle with learning how to read, read until I got into grad school. That's where I got some challenge. Okay, so these need to be part of our pedagogies. The good news is that is in our new language curriculum. Strand B, foundations of language, is really taking a central role now that it, it didn't always get center stage before. Now it is. And we know now about all the ways that these things, these comprehension and composition and, and oral and visual language integrate and feed into our, our neural systems. And so strand A is this overarching strand which encompasses digital literacy. So while the 2023 curriculum didn't anticipate AI, it certainly anticipates critical digital literacies. So I just have highlighted two of the many expectations that teachers are expected to teach. Um, conduct research considering accuracy, credibility, and perspectives with a focus on misinformation, disinformation, and curated information. These are the literacies that we need for critical literacy in these times. And do what with that? Use appropriate digital and media tools, including AI, in its place to support the design process. And that is the work that we are doing and the Thank space you. that we're in now. Thank you. 11 seconds. You want to come here? OK. While you're getting ready, I'm our third presenter is Dr. Robin Ruttenberg-Rosen, a former classroom teacher and administrator. She's an assistant professor at Ontario Tech University. Her research explores the tensions and possibilities of belonging and inclusion in STEAM learning environments for historically marginalized learners. So STEAM includes science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you um, for joining us tonight. I'm an inclusion scholar. When I think about AI, I wonder about what AI does to our thinking about inclusion and our practice of inclusion. I wanted to begin with this quote from Dr. Russell Schilling, who is Chief Scientific Officer at the American Psychological Association. Education is at a precipice, but even more so, the quick advance of AI in the educational world has created an inflection point for us. Will artificial intelligence push us into a space where we increase disparities? Or can we find ways to leverage AI to make education a more inclusive space for learners? I really hope it's the latter. In the short time I have to speak with you today, I hope to convince you that we can leverage AI for a more inclusive space and more belonging. But it does take work because inclusive AI, as we've heard, is not automatic. So I begin, especially since we're sitting here, with a quick look at history. If you remember this, sorry for dating you. Um, the calculator. It's 1986, and teachers, parents, and other stakeholders are quite worried about the, what the calculator will mean for mathematics education. We are experiencing a similar dynamic right now. Indeed, I have seen some social media bring up this picture to compare the calculator in 1986 to what is happening today with chat GPT. So I think the calculator can help us to think about how education evolves when it gets poked 
by a technology like AI. So what have we learned from and about calculator use vis-a-vis -vis learning mathematics? The first two pictures show times where we absolutely don't want children to use a calculator to learn mathematics. It's when they're developing their mental images of number or when they're learning to be flexible. We want them to play with the number. We don't want them to use calculators. But the third picture on the side is a time where we actually want students to use calculators. This might not be something you recognize. It's a task that I designed. It's in a publication. If you'd like it, I'm very happy to share after the presentation. But the purpose of the task is to teach proportional reasoning relationships between numbers and the proportions that they represent. Now, I used task design to design this task. I did it in over 15 classes with learners that ranged from children to adults to university students. I did it with children who had special learning needs, um, mathematically gifted, um, pre-service teachers. I've done it with a whole bunch of people. And each time I've tested the calculator, against not having the calculator. And in every case, we needed the calculator. Without the calculator, they've put too much focus into using mental mathematics and calculating the numbers, and they never focused on the proportional reasoning that was inherent in the task. And so shifting to the calculator and building on knowledge they already had allowed them to build advanced mathematical knowledge. Since 1986, we have learned to distinguish when the calculator supports our teaching efforts and when it doesn't. NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, tells us that the shift to AI requires evolutionary, not revolutionary change. In the next while, as we are exploring AI as researchers, teachers, parents, and students, we need to figure out what aspects of our AI evolve our learning designs. Both Mary and Eunice have spoken about these ideas. I want to now look more closely at leveraging AI for inclusion. AI is really old news for mathematics. We have been exploring intelligent learning systems since the 1970s. I've shown here a picture of Wolfram Alpha it's not exactly an AI, but it operates very similar to an AI in the classroom. And so we're no strangers to this. When I look at AI and inclusion, I'm particularly interested in how it can support learners who experience mathematics difficulties. This is really a wicked problem, and one that is not being solved in any, any near, anytime soon at all. Yet mathematics is a major gatekeeper. There are few jobs that don't require some mathematical knowledge, and we need mathematical knowledge to function in the everyday world. At its most basic, mathematics should be an inalienable right for every single child, but it's not right now. Mathematics for all is a labor intensive endeavor that we don't completely understand. There is still so much to do and kids are falling through the cracks every single day while we all try to figure this out. And so enter AI. AI is in no way a panacea, as people have described already. But it is helping us to provide access where there wasn't before. I'm about to share with you one example of AI, of an AI intelligent tutoring system. Um, that is, it's very well researched, and it's something that I use to help children gain access to mathematical ideas, uh, children who are experiencing mathematics difficulties. If you ask any mathematics educator, we will tell you that we hate the word mastery. But if I have a kid that is having difficulty in mathematics, I am giving him Alex because it's going to help him. And so it's not a perfect answer, but until we could find that perfect answer, until we can educate our kids the way they need to be educated, AI can step in and help us as teachers, parents, administrators, and professors. So we come back to Dr. Schilling. 
we can either increase disparities in our education system or we can shrink them. We are really at an inflection point. If AI is going to be inclusive, we have to consider some things about AI. We can't forget the human. Both Eunice and Mary have talked about the relationships that are possible and should happen mm -hmm. and need to happen through AI. And so when I work with a student with Alex, I infuse the relationship back in again. It's less labor intensive, mm -hmm. but there's still some labor involved and it still has to revolve around the human, both the child and the mediator. We need anti-deficit and strength-based tools. So much of, of what is out there is about fixing children. Tools that fix children are not inclusive. AI in education needs to support education in evolving. It is not there to create a revolution. AI should grow what's going well, help us save time to focus more on the good, and help us to reach more learners. Lastly, and AI is quite away from this, but I believe this should be the goal of the future. We should think about the different variable ways that students learn, and this should be part of the way that our AI learns. So in closing, it's, I understand it's a, it's a hard time for teachers. Here are some questions that teachers can ask themselves about it when they're adapting AI and wondering if it's an inclusive tool. These questions are adapted and some taken directly from a, um, from a document from the Office of, of the US Educational Technology, which I can also very happy to share with you after the presentation, just send me an email. So to what extent is AI enabling adaptation to students' strengths and not just their deficits? How are youth voices involved in choosing and using AI for their own learning? What agency are we giving to the learners to choose the AI that's best for them? Is AI for teachers leading to narrow or robust activities? And if they are leading to narrow activities, what are we doing to make them wider? so that they can incorporate more of the type of learning that we want our students to have. Does AI support the whole learner to be active participants or are they just sitting there passively intaking information? When AI is used, are students' privacy and data protected? And finally, what processes, and this speaks directly to what you just spoke about, Mary, we need processes in place to identify the biases, barriers, and any of the, the teachers and students are coming into contact with when they're dealing with AI. And then how are those emergent issues addressed? Thank you very, very much. And I think I'm the last one, so. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of you. Those are really fabulous presentations and you've raised such interesting questions. Okay, I've got this, this one. I have a question from the people online for, for Eunice. Um, can AI skills-based learning, AI skills-based learning be taught in classes of 35 students? Doesn't it require one-on-one -on -one teaching? You know, comparing curriculum, differentiated instruction and personalized instruction have been our educational motto. We always wanted to achieve that goal, but in reality, it's almost impossible. And I think with AI potential, by leveraging AI now, we actually can realize that. But it, again, as our two panelists mentioned, it requires a lot of groundwork but one-on-one, you know, there are a lot of different ways to engage our students. And you think about it, when students work on problems, math problems, writing, 
uh, literacy, where are our teachers' eyes on the paper? They can have their eyes on students as they do the data coming in. They are automatically processed so the teacher really can, teacher's hands can be free so that they really can focus on students. And I think I believe in that power. However, it comes with a lot of um, uh, potential uh, challenges to make that happen, right? So I believe in that. I think it really can, if I think of, I was thinking, driving, com coming here, driving and thought, when we think about our doctors, medical specialists, they utilize technologies heavily. Mm -hmm. Now, robots now doing surgery, right? And we don't question that. It's almost like necessary steps, right? But when it comes to education, education is the last field that technologies come to innovate. But then when the generative AI came out, do you know what two fields where people are talking about as a, uh, the field that will be most impacted by this whole development? Education. Why? Because generative AI can finally provide the opportunity to personalize and provide individualized support for our students. I believe that. But how are we going to achieve that? Right? And uh, when it comes to education, as our two panelists already mentioned, education, we can't educate, the AI cannot replace humans, right? It cannot replace teachers, right? So I think the, to make it happen and teachers could be fully empowered and our students can be fully empowered so that they're in control of technologies rather than technologies drive education uh, fields. To do that, we all have to work together. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, computer science, data scientists, programmers, they dictate the development of AI right now. Not educators, not the theorists, those people who do research on how children's mind works and how students work and how, how teachers develop their competency. We cannot let the education field taken over by those um, computer science, data scientists, and those people coming from outside. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question for Robin. What kind of teacher professional development program can be feasibly developed to support AI integration for math education? It's a good question. Are you doing your PhD? Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> it's, it's part of a larger question um, that um, we're grappling with now around um, supporting teachers in the classroom um, developing their own mathematical knowledge and supporting the mathematical develop, development of their students. And generally, the PD of teachers in this situation takes the first step, which is um, not eliminating fear, but lowering the fear around uh, mathematics mm -hmm. integrated with almost anything, um, <laughs> especially AI. And, and how they can be learners and develop at the same time. And the second step is to give them agency, mm -hmm. to give them power over what happens, to develop the ideas with them, through them. How are their practices right now? They're good practices. They're practices in the classroom that they're doing well. How do they lend themselves now to working with AI? What things can highlight and what administrative tasks can go to the side? And the PD would revolve around them deciding for themselves how that would work and testing it out. There was a, also a question about the, your reaction to the cell phone ban. Yeah. So we were curious what, what the other panelists felt about the, the, the implications of that or what that means for I want to hear from our you know, people here, mm -hmm. how they reacted when you saw that news. It's less than a week announcement, right? My guess is that, the, that people are fairly divided on this, yeah. bit, right? So the, the argument is it's easier to have less of these things. because And there is a lot of looking after stuff that goes on. It's like, no, you can't use that now. Yes, it, I'm going to keep it here. It becomes, it's another distraction. Yeah. Um, Students just watch Facebook. You know, they have, you know, they can't do anything without phone, right? Everybody's addicted, and it's not just children. Everybody, mm -hmm. our entire society, including myself, right? So they are just wasting their 
class time just playing with the phone, that's wrong use of technologies, right? It's almost like a throwing a baby with the basket, you know, the, 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 the best stuff. Can we talk for a second about why smartphones are in schools? It's because, that's where the feedback is. It's okay. <laughs> Um, I was a t I was just coming into graduate studies when that policy is when my children were in school. So I'm signing off as a parent on the school policy of use, right? So BYOD, bring your own device to school. It was a policy. Why? Because it was up to individual school councils, parent councils, to fundraise the money for laptops and Chromebooks and things like that. And to fill those gaps, that's what school boards did. Um, coming from um, my last school where you know the school parent council could maybe raise two thousand dollars a year um and that was supposed to go for smart boards playground equipment laptops like uh, there is so much that's not funded <laughs> there is so much so you want to talk about the digital buy right. um none of this happened happens without the money and the support and 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 technology breaks down constantly too it's there's a constant labor to it so there's a sustainability mm -hmm. issue as well yeah so yeah um, i'm a, i'm pro <laughs> <laughs> um for the reasons that eunice mentioned as well um it's part of a larger conversation about the lawsuit against the big tech companies mm -hmm. um for social media against mm -hmm. for School boards for social media regulation. I think that's a fantastic idea. I wish more school boards would get on board with that. There was a quote by student actually saying, our own students saying, instead of banning, why don't they engage us talk about literacy, technology yeah. literacy? I thought that summed up. Hello. Yes. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you all. Uh, my name's Sue. Um, I have some thoughts, but I don't know if they're put together like a question that's spoken like a classic academic, but okay, I'm going to try. <laughs> so we know from studies of um, ed, ed tech platforms of learning management systems and so on that they are they do impact how teachers teach how professor how universities teach how students respond that the technology is guiding how the teaching and learning experiences people who use um, learning management systems. So I just kind of want to put that there. And then I want to think about some of the things that were raised about about how teachers need to be the leaders, not the followers. But I feel like where are the followers like and also I want because I want to situate this within the broader context of the fact that these are private industries for the most part that are developing these product pro products mm -hmm. and that are being sold. And I mean, nobody wanted to really talk about the privacy and data pieces, but I think they're significant and so i guess i'm a little bit skeptical that teachers and educators are going to be able to be able to lead this when we have evidence that the um that we're not seeing that with platform for example that platformization and also we know that there's private sector motives um that have a that are go that are different from educational motives oftentimes so I guess I would like to just hear a little bit more about how you see AI in terms of how it's, I mean, I, I'm a newbie, but I, but I bring my old concerns to a new technology. So I guess that's what I'm really interested in is thinking about how AI operates similarly different from other kinds of private sector educational incursions. And how do we think about that within the, many uh, many issues that have already been raised around distraction screen time behavior social relations all that kind of stuff so however you want to take that up i'd just like to hear what you have to say about that thank you anybody like to start that the the data privacy issue has been it's nothing new it's nothing new technologies and how lms the learning management systems been now adopted by every single school board in Ontario, for example, right? Nothing new, and but none was done so far. There was no policy. We didn't have any policy on how to protect student, you know, privacy, data security when it comes to technology integration into our educational system. Now I hear conversations happening right now. 
most of boards now, any technology company approaches our board, say, hey, use our AI product. Actually, now they are creating a protocol. So we have a committee, uh, Ontario, you know, and uh, each board actually now working together, all the boards are working together to really have that policy in place. So I see that as a huge improvement, way overdue, and we have to act really, really hard to really protect this. Uh, and again, if you think about how Google Cloud is built, Microsoft, all these big companies and how they design these you know, systems, uh, if you think of OpenAI, ChatGPT, and all of those, not even in Canadian, it's not made in Canada, right? And where do the data go? When we use these data, where do they go, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have to think really carefully about all this. At least our school boards are started to really work so hard to put the protocols and policies together to really track it down. And I think it's important, um, and I just, I, I can't agree more, actually, how important it is right now. There's also a really a lot of good work being done through UNESCO in terms of trying to have these kinds of conversations across. And I've been working this area for a long time, and having those conversations across these different sectors of society is always challenging. Um, you know, I used to work with Apple and IBM in the old days, and, and there was always that, that things um, because it was all about you know selling for them but but um, it, but there are still ways to have um, an influence on this but we have to speak up and what's nice about the UNESCO work is that this is internationally international groups of people working on frameworks that will be usable that sort of demands that the AI industry you know follow certain rules live up to particular standards and that until that kind of happens it's not going to be um you know it, it it they will need to work on them so i think there's enough oversight of this now that i i have a feeling that in time that we will get some things out of that um but you know did anybody else want to agree right. on that I just want to add, and this is a shout out to Saltan, um, who's ran out sitting beside you, whose doctoral dissertation is in a cutting edge area right now called ethno computing, mm -hmm. which is studying um, how to agentify, <laughs> how, the, how, the, how to support the agency mm -hmm. and historically marginalized com communities to understand those things that are happening, because they are, we can't get rid of them, and to, in ways, um, take control around them and um, for their communities. And so it's, it's, it's a problem we can't get rid of, and there's a lot of ways um, to come at it. And I think agency for learners and their teachers is, is quite, um, it's, it's quite an important way to to, to, to at least tackle it a little bit, to understand it, and then to develop um, ways of, of answering it. I just, I wanna say like, yes, to, to the problem that you posed. I, I agree that's a problem. Um, and you raised at the beginning the issue of the ways that, let's say a learning management system directs a pedagogy. Um, and so one of the things that I'm interested in is um, the agency of the machine. So yes, human agency, but how and in what ways is that sometimes marginalized by machine agency? And what are some of the unintended mm -hmm. consequences when we kind of go in thinking that we have more control than we actually do? So one of the things I like to study in education context is unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be some when we go in especially with technology with kind of a blind faith like this this is going to be the thing that helps us um it's a as everybody i think is highlighting that's an incredibly complex proposition it's not something you enter into with blind faith and i think unfortunately in too many cases that's been thinking of like google classroom for example in microsoft office all of that free stuff that was fed to schools has been fed into these generative AIs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've got a lot of issues with data and privacy. Yeah. 
That's all right, we can hear you okay. anyway. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Peter, and uh, I do have questions and a few follow-up questions um, to maybe all the panelists. So I'm the focus on the research and the finding and building solution, helping students to, um, for the higher education market. Um, so because the uh, university dropout for students during the pandemic time is, is getting big issues. So we find out maybe almost 31% of students experience dropout experience. So um, particularly for the international and higher education market, and we find out those, you know, because the international students play significant factors for higher education. They being experienced multiple, you know, challenges in finance, careers, mental health, and graduating on time. So I'm thinking about, because um, faculty and university are very sensitive about data, and uh, is there any specific solutions um, each university and, and faculty is think about building the tracking and monitoring student performance so they can graduate on times or potentially like, you know, um, can providing um, onboarding maybe like uh, advising support. So uh, I know some institutions in the US are working with some third party on these sectors, but for a Canadian institution, because it's, it's getting bigger issue now, so I'm not sure, is there any like ongoing solutions it was developed by the faculty itself or maybe there's third party um, collaborations going on like that. That's my big first question. And second question about data privacy. I know it's very sensitive for most like institutions. And uh, so how does it work uh, if you don't really, um, you know, for example, like if it's um, large engagement with the gen AI from students perspective, um, obviously there are some solutions maybe by integrating with those tools um, potentially, do you think the faculty will be really care or building some policy in the future? Like, it's like, for example, for K twelve right now, you, you're not allowed to use smartphone because it's, you know there is some rules policy. What about the higher education? Do you think there's some policy will come up um, by banning? Um, you know, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah some right, some right, right, right. So <laughs> that, that would just you know uh, want to know what is forecast for the policy for. Anybody want to tackle in either of those? I, I actually have a project right now <laughs> in higher education, mm -hmm. and I'm working. I did not develop the AI. I'm working with a computer scientist who did develop the AI. Um, and we're having conversations, a lot of conversations around this, because I'm very concerned about inclusion and belonging, mm -hmm. and the, which is directly connected to retention in STEM. Um, but how much um, information do we take in order to save education? How much do we collect in order to, um, to help students? And, and where is our line that we, we won't cross? And so far, Canada that I know of doesn't really implement these AIs. And they go very deep. They analyze, um, they, they analyze paths that individual students, this, this AI we're working with analyzes paths that individual students take, takes and where they get into trouble as a whole so that they could work with the teachers and say, your class is the pressure point and all our students are dropping out after your class. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, but the ethics of that is quite mind boggling. Like it's quite mind boggling and it will probably take a while to come into Canada, I imagine, because we're more, um, protective of our, of our ethics. Um, so our international students, as you know, just take U of T as an example. Over 60% of U of T's revenue is relying on international student tuitions. The future of Canada. So we changed the migration pathway, right? So now actually the current uh, mm -hmm. migration model is actually bring our students to the university and they will have the time to culturalize, right? And they will be ready to enter Canadian workforce uh, when they graduate, rather than bringing adult migrate, migrator, uh, mig migrants. Um, so it's a different pathway. So their success is so critical. It is extremely important for mm -hmm. Canadian economy and future. Now, when our international students come, they come just based on language test. Once they meet the language test requirement, they think they are ready. And then they arrive on campus, they can't even order pizza. And this is coming from our research. And that social isolation, the lack of belonging, 
if they have their buddies who share the same language, they just stay because they feel safe there and they never integrate them into the system. And that's a huge loss, right? So it's extremely important to really invest, not just taking advantage of their financial contributions through tuitions, actually, we have to invest in them by creating support system that works for these people, right? Like it is really, a, I think oftentimes my argument is we're not doing that enough right yeah. now, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So technology for sure, because their number one barriers are languages. But language is a social practice. <laughs> and you mentioned the word belonging. Yeah. There's a human pedagogical thing that we need to do better as universities, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yes. I have a question. Oh, sorry. And we got one and right, one oh, behind. And there. Sorry about that. Uh, I I just wanted to remind people that the university question will be taken up next week. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's so true. So we'll answer that get, question then. Yeah, but okay. I, I have a question as a you know, retired professor who's lived through these massive technological changes. People say universities don't change, but think of where we are now compared to where we were 40 years ago from you know, the typewriter to the word processor um, and, and now to AI. And it strikes me that with the earlier technological changes, we had a bit of time. You know, the internet happened, it didn't take over right away, we adapted, websites gradually became, you know, the core places for information. Uh, but we were able to get there sort of in steps at a time. Is it different now with AI? It strikes me that it yeah, is. That, it's a that, different technology. Do we have time? Or is it here and are we just in the process? I mean, a year and a half ago, we weren't even talking about it. Uh, although uh, some yeah. the mathematicians work, mm -hmm. but is there a qualitative difference because of, of the rapidity with which this has happened? I want to point out that all of our talks mm -hmm. assumes that AI is already in the classroom. Mm -hmm. None of us talk to them implementing it for the first time. It's very different. When that calculator come, came out, it was about implementing that calculator. It's in the classroom. It was in the classroom before before we started talking about yeah. it. And the pace at which it's moving is so fast. Mm -hmm. And we move so slow in education. We do, we do. But the publications have been out, there's about five or six years worth of publications out there already. But, but it, it, it has to reach a certain level before it re, you know, penetrates everybody's consciousness. But uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, well, I mean, my own experience of it, like a year ago, is <laughs> we were all, everybody's, it just like all of a sudden burst onto the scene, right? I'm sure it was all like coming and people who knew knew, but for the vast global majority, it was just like, oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. Now we have to deal with it. Um, and there's been all kinds of conversations. I went to a workshop at a different university last week. Um, there's workshops in schools and universities as a quote from my high school teacher said. Um, so yeah, we're grappling with it. And that, yeah, the time is not anyone's friend. <laughs> and that's why the agency piece is important. But, but I think as both Robin and Eunice show, there's lots of different kinds of AI. Um, there's like the small scale kind of like build to suit um, kinds of things that are happening that I think are probably a lot more promising. But what we're seeing, you know, I'm seeing in terms of language education and literacy development is um, the like the incursion all of a sudden of generative AI is a massive disruptor that, you know, there are some real concerns yeah. about that. Right. Yeah, but, Hi. sorry, silver lining. Are we adapting our pedagogies? Like, are we going towards more of the valuing voice and thinking piece? Absolutely we are. So that's, that's the silver lining in it all, yeah. The technologies that we are talking about are not the same. Okay, I want to just play a little thing here. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, how are you today? I'm here and ready to assist you. Awesome. How are you? How's yeah. the day going? Awesome. I'm having fun here. Um, no, Hangul Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions or need assistance in Korean, feel free to ask. 그럼 한국말로 안녕하세요 한번 해봐. 안녕하세요. 만나서 반가워요. 어떻게 도와드릴까요? 
Right. So how? My ChatGPT can speak any language. I can code switch. Right. So this is the level. And if I tried to develop this like seven years ago, because that was how I started my short grant project, you yeah. saw Balance AI, right? So when I started the project seven years ago, and Balance AI, it had a term AI. Mm -hmm. And people, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Now is our right, everyday language. Mm -hmm. What happened? What happened over the past seven years? Now, are we moving fast enough? We're not. Well, the cheating, right? The, the, the yeah. video that I played, here's the thing. Now we're talking about future jobs. What jobs are going to last and what jobs are going to disappear? Mm -hmm. We are educating our next future generations. If we don't tr change our edu educational goals, if we don't adjust what we teach mm -hmm. and how we assess, if we just keep assessing the way that we assessed, the discrete knowledge, knowledge piece, how many, you know, how much do you remember? So then now you can write down correct answer. If you could just keep doing that, we'll fail. I think we're going to be really in a bad place. We have to change so that if you don't really refocus our educational goals, skills, and assess those skills, which is what? High level. What ChatGPT cannot do, right? So our students have to be engaged in learning skills that are beyond what ChatGPT does. ChatGPT is great summarizing, right? ChatGPT does such mm -hmm. a, you know, so that they don't have to. Now they have to be able to ask critical questions, solving critical problems, right? So those are the skills that are so important, transferable skills. So we need to change our edu educational goals and how we teach our students, how we assess the students. If you don't do, we're going to be constantly talking about why students are cheating because you didn't change your assignment. That's why they are cheating, right? Okay. One more question. I'm a grandmother, and I'm, I have children, uh, grandchildren, who are uh, four, three and soon to be four, uh, going to francophone schools. So uh, can you just help me a little bit about uh, understanding how AI is taught in French uh, schools? I'm not sure. Any of us have exper direct experience with that, and not with, with little, um, not with very small kids. I think, um, yes, I'm not. I mean, there's a lot of interest in in how to use AI with edu um, with language learning, but I don't know. Do you know of any? No, no. French is. I I think it's we are bilingual country, right? Yeah. But when it comes to uh, Two official language resources and attention, we're not giving equal attention, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of resource development, AI integration into French language teaching and learning, we're not there yet. Yeah. So that's another area that we really need to work hard. Yeah. yeah. There's a, yeah. It, there was one more question to sort of, um, that somebody had asked, and it, it, it actually is being answered in the last few minutes, but um, it was what our thoughts were about skills needed for children's development with the presence of AI instead of traditional skills like reading, writing, and mm -hmm. mathematics. And I think we'd certainly say that we're, we're still doing those. It's just that the process is um, different. They're not, it, they're not, we're not leaving those aside. It's just that they're done in a different way. I think that would be. How are yeah. you going to evaluate the output if you can't read it? <laughs> well, we exactly. To, that's right. That's, that's yes, reading exactly. And, and writing is not just a product. It's a, no, it's a thinking, it's a thinking, yeah. it's a thinking process and yeah. it's a feeling process. And so, and we teach composition now multimodally. We don't just do mm -hmm. writing. We do things in all mm -hmm. kinds of different modes, combine them. Right. Um, yeah. So we're not giving that's up on, on, no, on all of those no, no, no. things because that's how we understand. Mm -hmm. Those are the, you know, the avenues by which we yeah. understand. And the AI is merely, merely looking at, the, at how we might do that. And, um, and could we do it in a way that does actually mm -hmm. leave more time for yeah. teachers to be yeah. more generatively and usefully engaged with students in a yeah. more human way, which would be- AI good. is a assistance. They are interns. They are not- Excellent. Right? You have to train them, you have to tame them, 
and uh, our students can have their own assistance, right? One okay. of the benefits okay. that AI has done to the education system is it has separated out that basic knowledge from mm -hmm. the critical thinking. Yeah. Because AI can only take care of that basic knowledge and the human has to take care of that critical thinking. Mm -hmm. And so it has really identified it for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's really fascinating. So one project that I did with the ministry and then there were some concerns about our secondary school students struggling and dropping out. Um, especially when they reach grade 10. So the project started. So when we work with, uh, so history was one subject and working with the history teachers and then we visited and doing class observations and you know, some of the really great pedagogical innovations that teachers were doing was instead of doing, you know, if you remember history exam, you have to remember every single detail. What year, right? Canada has become independent like X, Y, and Z all that some students excel on those exams right those who are so good with that and the rest suffers and they hate history history is the most boring you know a subject x and z so this teacher changed that right so the assignment that student had in that classroom was actually they have to be the pick a historical figure from 1800s 1900s and now they have to simulate that they were they were acting out so they have to remember all the details about that historical figure, right? And then playing that role in front of everybody. And they have to videotape that, right? And here's a, and then someone who's struggling, who just doesn't like history at all, always bored, sitting in the back, doing something else. And all of a sudden, this student just brilliant, right? And performing beautifully, right? And then all of a sudden, teacher's like, I didn't know that he can do that. Right? It's a completely different uh, ways of uh, engaging our students. Yeah. So, AI can support that, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. I, we're going to call it um, to an end now. So, thank you, everybody, for your enthusiastic engagement. Thank you to all of our speakers and for people online and in person. And I'm now going to turn it back to Lynn for some closing thoughts. So, uh, on your behalf, again, I'd like to thank you, Claire, for moderating, uh, Robin and Mary and Eunice uh, for sharing these very valuable insights. I'm so much smarter now. And, and, and just to say thanks to our tech team mm -hmm. for supporting yes. us through this, to say that we hope to see you again next week and that a recording of this session will appear on our website, Mariah, yes? <laughs> will appear on our website in a couple of days. So thank you for coming.